Welcome you all to the global reach of the Arab Spring, a dialogue we'll be having for most of the day here. In, we'll be beginning with the globalization and culture aspect of it, and uh, specifically the international and regional cultural influences leading up to the Arab Spring. Uh, shorthand, I guess, for some history and context. Let me begin with that and, and uh, introduce uh, Johan Goltang, who's founder and director of Transcend, a peace and development network of conflicts with more than 300 members from over uh, 80 countries around the world and rector of Transcend at the Peace University. An experienced peace worker and professor of peace studies, he is widely regarded as the founder of the academic discipline of peace research and one of the leading pioneers of peace and conflict transformation in theory and practice. He has played an active role in helping mediate and prevent violence in uh, 45 major conflicts around the world over the past four decades and is the author of the United Nations first ever manual for trainers and participants of conflict transformation by peaceful means, the Transcend Approach. He has taught peace studies at the University of Hawaii uh, and uh, in also in uh, Tromso, uh, Alicante, uh, Ritz, Ritzkemaken, uh, I'm sorry about that, and the uh, peace, the European Peace uh, University, among many others. Johan Galtung established the Peace Research Institute in Oslo in 1959 and the Journal of Peace Research in 1964 and uh, co-launched the Nordic Institute for Peace Research in 2000. And on my left is uh, Mark Jürgensmeyer, who's a director of the Orfella Center for Global and International Studies, Professor of Sociology and Affiliate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He is an expert on religious violence, conflict resolution, and South Asian religion and politics, and has published more than 200 articles and 20 books, including the recently released Global Rebellion, Religious Challenges to the Secular State. He's widely read Terror in the Mind of God, The Global Rides of Religious Violence. Uh, uh, is in a revised edition. It's based on interviews with religious activists around the world, including individuals convicted of the 19... 93 World Trade Center bombing, leaders of Hamas and abortion clinic bombers in the United States. And the empty chair of is Stephen Zunas, of course, he's on his way here. He flew in from Bogota, Colombia, uh, where he was uh, um, procuring prostitutes for the uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Secret Service. Uh, and he will be uh, joining us later. Let me begin uh, with uh, Johan, and what I'd like to do with, with both Johan and, and, and Mark, just to, just to establish a sort of broad, before we get into the Arab Spring, we have to some, to some extent lay the groundwork for the, the region. And I guess in the broadest sense, we are in extra, you know, uh, 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 you know inevitably uh, Eurocentric. And... Um, there's just a general assumption that uh, the Arab and Islamic world missed the Renaissance and the Reformation. So is this, uh, assuming there's some, something to that, is what's happening now a belated example of one of those two? I don't see it that way. I see the Arab Spring or Decade or whatever it is essentially as a revolt and the third one against Western against imperialism. And the first one was, let us say, 1915-16, against the Ottoman Empire. And it was betrayed by Sykes Picot. All this is deposited in the history, and the history then becomes a major part of the culture. But the Ottoman Empire was Islamic. The second empire was the Italian. British French Empire and that was put to an end by the Nagib revolt, let us say 52 with the war in 56 and followed up by Gaddafi in September 69 and uh, it had an interesting enemy and that enemy was US that strongly condemned France and England for the October 29, 1956 suicide attack. So income, as anybody could have predicted by the time, the US-Israel Empire. 
And we are in that third stage now, and the US Israel Empire, one of its key methods was to introduce local elites, hegemonies. They were dictators. They could do almost anything they wanted to do with their population corruption, bribing, torture, whatever. US Israel would turn its back as long as they could be relied upon for Camp David type contributions and things of that type. So Ben Ali was as ambassador to Poland, was to go between between CIA and the Solidarność movement. And of course, one of the many sons of Mubarak was the Bank of America representative for the Middle East. So you, you had the whole thing. I mean, the usual panoply that you would expect from an empire. My problem intellectually has not been that it came, but why didn't it come before? <laughs> And uh, you have to be a journalist and fairly badly educated to think that it started with somebody's self-immolation in Tunisia. This has very, very deep roots. And uh, the empire strikes back. <laughs> Empires have a tendency to do. I know something about its methods, and I guess that would be a major part of it. But Ian, I would like to thank you for having me here. I have played out some of the cards as I see it. And I would like to emphasize, since the focus is on culture, that the memory of the past are deposited, sedimented in a very vast reservoir called history as a culture. I find it everywhere, but I also find Arabs, in a sense, knowing that they should not talk anti-imperialism, they should talk anti-dictatorship. That that's the discourse that is palatable to Americans, for instance. And as long as you ride right on that one in the human rights discourse, you are safe. When I then scratch my Arab friends a little bit, and they will be scratching for about two seconds, maybe three in the tough cases, what comes up is what I say. Well, just to touch on, uh, on uh, the 56 uh, preemptive strike on Egypt by France, Britain, and Israel, uh, an atavistic uh, imperialist death rattle, if you will, on the part of the French and the British. Uh, in my work in, in national security and US-Soviet uh, relations, I managed years ago to meet, get to know very well a fellow called Arthur, Arthur Macy Cox, who was the top CIA guy in um, Budapest in 1956. And he had worked out a deal with his Russian counterpart uh, Yuri Andropov, who later became the head of the KGB and later the general secretary of the, of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And of course, the Hungarian Revolution was well underway. And together, uh, Andropov and Arthur Macy Cox worked out a deal that the Russians did not want to crush the rebellion and be embarrassed internationally. So they had actually worked out a deal with uh, the uh, rebels which would have been a precursor for the other spring, which happened, of course, in 1989, the end of the Soviet Empire. And in many ways, it's quite possible that the Soviet Empire could have ended early. You just said that you don't understand why the Arab Spring didn't happen earlier. Um, but what blew that possibility was the uh, Israeli, French and British attack on the Suez, which entirely took the Hungarian Revolution off the headlines, gave the Russians the cover that they didn't want to have the international embarrassment of uh, crushing the Hungarian Revolution. But because of the uh, actions of the British, French, and the, which Eisenhower was furious about. Why was Eisenhower furious? Because he was secretly working with the Russians to try and bring about an early end to the Cold War. So. There is a little irony there. I think that's extremely important. It was the same week. The end of October 1956. I think this is an absolutely key factor. And what happened, of course, was that the French and the English gave up. Under and pressure from the Americans. Under pressure from the Americans. Very, very clear. And, uh, I mean, Eden's reaction was extremely strong, but uh, he gave in. And what happened then was also very importantly that Israel sooner or later had to withdraw from Sinai. And you had then the Gaza thing going on and the thing developed further. And the rest, as they say, is history. 
But they didn't take much time for the Arabs to discover it, <clears throat> that even if they had gotten rid of the Italians, the French, and the English, U.S. Israel had come to stay. <laughs> right. Well, let's, let's do a little uh, uh, brief sketch. Tail and wag and dog. And <laughs> let's do a little brief sketch uh, with Mark of, of uh, U.S. foreign policy starting with the period we're talking about. Actually, let's just go back to the end of World War II. Um, I think it was 47 in Syria, and of course Syria is now in the headlines. Um, in, in, I think it was in 47, there was a nationalist leader uh, who the US didn't like. The CIA station chief in uh, Damascus was a, a fellow called Miles Copeland, whose son founded, who, his son's actually a friend of mine, uh, founded the, uh, the rock group, The Police, uh, along with Sting. Uh, so he's a very successful record producer. But his dad was the CIA station chief, and they literally put in some corrupt general uh, to get rid of this guy. Uh, and began this pattern of, of, uh, of opposing Arab nationalism uh, and particularly Arab socialism uh, in the 50s. And of that, of course, was the brainchild of the Dallas brothers. They felt that the best way, one being Secretary of State and the other being the head of the CA, uh, under Eisenhower, they felt that the best way to counter Arab socialism uh, and nationalism was uh, to stimulate Islam. And my understanding was in the 50s, uh, the late 40s, the mosques in most of the Arab world were pretty much empty. And the real question is, and we've had this issue of blowback uh, more clear in terms of what happened in Afghanistan, uh, but uh, many scholars argue that the US actually created this blowback in the broadest sense by stimulating the green in order to fight the red and now we've ended up with the mess we have. Uh, it's an interesting thesis and, and not, un, not impossible. Uh, it's a scenario that we've seen in other cases. I know in North India and in the Punjab, uh, in, during the reign of Indira Gandhi, she tried to create a, a Khalistan movement among Sikhs to counter uh, the, the, um, the reigning Sikh political party there. And of course, that emerged into a movement of Sikh nationalism that then dominated Indian politics in the 1980s and resulted in her own death. Uh, the uprising in 1984, the Amritsar Rebellion of Sikhs was uh, catastrophic uh, for Indira Gandhi and then it, it continued the revolution for another uh, six years. So I, I have no doubt that the con one of the contexts of the Arab Spring is within this Kind of continuing saga, almost a soap opera uh, drama uh, between European and American uh, politics and, uh, uh, and, and Arab uh, nationalism, uh, and I don't deny that. But there's, there are other contexts, and I want to shift frame a little bit just for the purposes of our conversation uh, and put it within the context of globalization. Uh, because one of the Extraordinary things that has happened in the last 20 years is a diminishing of the power of the nation state. Uh, and, and it has become a poignant issue for precisely for developing countries in emerging nationalism and the creation of nationhood and national institutions uh, to have uh, a destructuring uh, politically, economically, militarily. Uh, of the power and the autonomy of particular nations, and perhaps even more importantly, culturally and in a demographic sense, the kind of uh, character of nationhood, of a national community, that gives force to nation-state identities. I mean, after all, the whole Enlightenment proposition of the nation-state was that it would be based upon naturally existing cultural communities. And this made a certain amount of sense in Europe where you had French people speaking French, French culture that had a certain identity. The Germans had more of a problem. They had to kind of create a German identity where there wasn't one easily. Uh, there's always been problems within the British Isles between the sub-regional identities and a British identity, but no matter. Uh, it, it gave us, there was a certain kind of credibility. Uh, when this template of political um, 
organization was forced on the rest of the world in the mid uh, 20th century, and we've forgotten how recent the nation and state idea has been pressed upon the rest of the world as a kind of constant template of what the way we naturally think people should organize themselves. <laughs> Uh, internationalism, even the word international has existed only for about 70 years. It's a very recent invention. When people challenged us when we were creating the Global Studies Program in Santa Barbara into why, why don't you call it what it should be called, international, I had to remind them that this term only sprang into existence academically when it sprang into the world politically in the 1950s. So we've existed as a world of nation states only recently in an era of globalization when, as I said, structurally the whole uh, character of the state apparatus uh, has been undermined. And more importantly, the cultural and demographic coherence of a national community has been uh, eroded in, in, in an era when everyone can ever live everywhere, and we do. Just go to LA and you'll find this extraordinary global community. So, LA is the second largest Filipino city after Manila. It's the second largest Iranian city after Tehran. So one of the largest Mexican cities. It's an extraordinary place, and everything is there. All of the cultural coherence and the character of those national communities. And, and you could imagine the kind of um, schizophrenia, particularly the second generation. Are we Filipino? Are we American? What are we? And of course, we can see the response in America and other parts of the world, particularly in Europe, to the, the intrusion of other cultural identities within what they imagine to be real French identity, real Norwegian identity, real Swedish identity. Uh, so nationhood is being challenged everywhere. Now I, I, I put this as a kind of broad context not only to what's going on in Arab Spring and the rise of religious nationalism and religious violence throughout the world because it is happening everywhere. It's not peculiar to the Middle East. But the form of protest, the form in which this anxiety, the the form in which an attempt to try to create a cultural integrity of the nation state or reclaim a national community in terms of national extremism, that is configured differently in different places. And in that sense, what happened in Arab Spring is a striking turn away from the kind of uh, uh, jihadi violence that had characterized this protest in the previous decade. And for me, that transition is the really interesting one. And it raises the larger question of whether the war on terror, as it has been imagined, particularly in the United States, will change. Of course, it largely depends on how the Americans respond to it, because they've largely created the problem. Uh, but, but it creates an opportunity for a transition in that way of thinking. And whether there will be a transition is really, I think, a question we should be having around this table. Well, um, in terms of globalism, it seems to me uh, that that we are in Adam Smith's world where capital transcends sovereignty um, and that there has been a global elite created, 1% of the 1%. You were, you were mentioning earlier Mubarak's son. Uh, they can buy their entrance into the global elite as long as they can steal billions freely. Uh, Gaddafi's son also being a, a member. Um, it seems to me that the... That the uh, the winners so far in globalism have been Wall Street and Chinese peasants. Uh, the rest of us are pretty much losers, um, particularly the, the Western middle classes. But in contrast to, to, to the to, uh, middle classes in, in the West and particularly here in the United States becoming an endangered species, it seems to me that the Arab Spring in many ways is the reverse in terms of a, of a, of a middle class trying to push its way uh, through this ceiling, this tremendous, uh, 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 you know, ossified, Jurassic uh, leadership, whether they're kings or potentates uh, or colonels, uh, who have stolen the whole, whole uh, shebang. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a, a, a difference. Would you agree? I think there's several dynamics at work. That's certainly one of them. Uh, but, but there is, as my colleague Bill Robinson at and sociology department at Santa Barbara uh, frequently reminds us, a split among the 1%. Uh, that is between national elites and global elites. Uh, uh, the billionaires of, uh, who, who have made their money and try to, um, and, and to try to build their power and their strength and their continuing uh, 
sources of income solely on a national basis, uh, and those who have transnational uh, sources of, uh, of power, a transnational network, a transnational community of, uh, who are accountable to no nation and have no interest in developing nationhood. And there's a t tension within those two kinds of uh, elites. Uh, and the degree to which this is uh, a present in, in the, uh, uh, the Arab Spring calculation, I think is quite interesting because the rise of the Salafi movement, for example, shows uh, with an enormous amount of money that comes from the outside, from Saudi Arabia, it is a way in which a transnational movement has undercut both the democratic movement within Egypt and the traditional uh, elite that tries to control it. So now you have a, a new force, and it's one that is, is a claim to kind of popularism, but with enormous amount of money behind it. And that's, that's, that's rather scary. And you see some of the same dynamics happening in American politics on the, in, the, in the fringes of the radical right, where a new a pop popularism is funded by extraordinarily uh, well-funded uh, elite with transnational roots who really ultimately don't care about national identity. They care about creating their own basis of power. Well, of course, Saudi Arabia and I suppose the, the, uh, the IRGC government of, of Iran are the counter-revolutionaries in our conversation yes. today. And it was interesting to note that during the uh, Tahrir Square uh, demonstrations that the Saudi king was on the phone every day to Obama screaming at him saying, let Mubarak kill those kids, you know. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Zunas, who's a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, where he chairs the program in Middle East Studies. A native of North Carolina, Professor Zunas uh, received his PhD from Cornell University, his MA from Temple University, and his BA from Oberlin College. He has previously served on the faculty of Ithaca College, the University of Puget Sound, and Whitman College. He serves as a senior policy analyst at the Foreign Policy and Focus Project of the Institute for Policy Studies and Associate Editor of Peace Review and Chair of the Academic Advisory Committee for the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. Welcome. Good to be here. Uh, let me, uh, you, you missed an earlier question here. We're trying to s sort of lay the historical groundwork to the, for the Arab Spring and I mentioned the Dulles brothers uh, creating uh, or stimulating Islam as a way to stop Arab mm -hmm. nationalism and, and uh, in particular Arab socialism, um, being an extension of the Soviet Cold War influence. Um, and, and I brought up the idea of blowback. So give us your reading of sketches through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and up to the moment. <laughs> we'll a couple of minutes. Well, it's interesting that, uh, that initially uh, the United States uh, was um, fairly positive about Nasser in the hope that uh, he was a counter to uh, the, the Soviets. We actually um, ended up uh, siding with them against the tripartite invasion in 1956 because Eisenhower was wise enough to recognize that if we um, uh, did not stand up for um, international law and against uh, 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 <clears throat> this, uh, the neo-imperialism, that the only major power that, that would do such a thing would be the Soviet Union and um, that it would um, it would gain, uh, that would, it would strengthen our, our enemies, there would be a you know, serious um, you know, blowback and the like. And, and so the United States took a very principled stand saying we don't like Nasser, but uh, he's, yes, he supports terrorism and, and all this kind of, and, and um, maybe <clears throat> like even the whole, whole question of what chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction was an issue back then, but uh, Eisenhower, unlike the Bush administration and many Democrats who supported Bush, um, uh, recognized that um, you know, it would be a um, you know, there'd be a serious blowback if we did anything anything else, um, but uh, that but when it, it appeared you know, that Nasser was going towards the Soviet uh, uh, um, <clears throat> side, uh, you know things escalated in the late fifties with the Dulles brothers, as you say. But it really took off in a big big way uh, under, under Reagan, of course, with the um, um, you know, not not just support of the Mujahideen in um, Afghanistan, but um, uh, other other elements as as well. Uh, I remember in the early, I remember back in the eighties, uh, while it was uh, illegal for anybody in the um, uh, U.S. consulate in Jerusalem to meet with anybody from uh, the PLO, uh, they met regularly with Hamas people. <laughs> and um, there's um, and and we even you know part of the um, um, even before Iran Contra, uh, the um, 
the U.S. was funneling arms to Iran to help with the, help the some of the Mujahideen groups in the, in Western uh, Afghanistan they had contact with, and in fact um, uh, handed over a list of five of, of, of a thousand uh, members of the Tudeh party, which they had picked up from a Soviet defector, which they handed over to the mullahs, and they ended up tracking down and massacring five hundred of them. So um, there, there there is very much this history of. Um, of support you know, for um, you know, for the hardline um, hardline Islamist, and um, and uh, we, we've obviously seen the, the blowback on a whole number number of levels. Well, uh, Johan, you 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 brought up the the, the pivotal change uh, back at the time of uh, fifty six, and that is the, the the pivot, as they say nowadays, to Israel. Um, I have a friend who's the who's the character that uh, George Clooney played in in the movie Syriana. His name is Bob Bear, he, former CIA guy who's seen the light, and is you know being releasing as much information as he can. Um, he said that when <laughs> just to touch on on the recent stuff that uh, Stephen brought up, he said every every time that he would recruit a Palestinian for the CIA, Sippy Livni who was then the, the, the Mossad uh, uh, oper head of operations, who subsequently led the Kadima party, the centrist party uh, in Israel, she would have this guy murdered. <laughs> and that was the game that they were playing. So talk, t t t give us a sense of how uh, the tail was allowed to wag the dog. I'd like to add to that. I was sitting in the house, the say, Sam Rayburn building next to Congress, with some Congress representatives and I told them about my talks with Taliban and what was the Taliban perspective. And I'm not going to that, that's outside of a theme, but they said, why didn't CIA tell us this? And I said, central yes, agency yes, intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not impressed. If you look at the enormous record of the mistakes they have made, they just continue fumbling from one to the other. So that's not an organization I could put much credibility into and pay much attention to. But I would like to point to a very basic point in Arab countries. And also, the let us say, the 56 countries members of the OIC, which incidentally changed the C from conference to cooperation, a very important step. The next step would be C for community. I recommended that one and pointed out they don't have to change the stationery. They can keep OIC all the time. <laughs> now, the dilemma is to be a Muslim member of the Ummah, the community of the believers, and to be a citizen of the state. Now, the people in general will favor the Ummah. The leaders will have a tendency to favor the state. When Islam is monotheistic, it is not to rule out Yahweh and God, that may be one aspect of it, to rule out alternative sources of power to Allah. And that rules out unless you can find a clever formula. Mm -hmm. And that is what Erdogan has been trying to do. I think to a large extent masterfully. But I point it out because, you see, it has to do with so much of what we're talking about and to pick up Mark's point. You would have the Muslims fight, let us say, a jihad. And they will do it by what they tell me is the only language the West understands, which is violence. And they have impressive statistics about who are the most violent countries in the world. Well, they seem to have a point. Then uh, whether it works is another factor. You would have them doing that. Then you would have the new bourgeoisie in these countries who are citizens, and they will come up with a non-violent protest in the streets. They will do that. And of course, if you look at the country that first introduced parity between men and women in the Muslim world, the country that first did it, and the country by far the most advanced in that regard, done by Burgiba in 1956, Tunisia. You find from the TV oceans of women swarming in the streets. You find quite a lot in other countries too, particularly in Egypt. Then you come to the countries that have not been touched by that and who are envious and they will come. Now, that reminds me then of 
I think a very important distinction here because now we have to come in with typologies and things of that type. You see, the journalistic thing was something starting in Tunisia moving east. And they forgot Algeria because Algeria is much worse in terms of dictatorship and killing more than a quarter million of its inhabitants, but they're on the western side. And they have even come up with a promise of recognizing Israel when time is ripe. So they will not be touched. But the point about it is this, that most of these countries are old colonies. And the colonizers, be that the Italians from 1911 or whoever it is, after the most terrible state terrorism attack on oasis from Italian planes, they don't care a damn about the fault lines inside the countries. They just wrap it up and they draw the borders and they draw all the kinds of, particularly the English, who always ruled by rulers, rulers meaning a kind of device to draw straight lines. You look at the map of the US and you can see a little exercise how that is done. Now, this kind of thing creates countries that are not countries. And you can talk about states and nations it's a failed state from the beginning. There is no nation. You cannot put together Fasan and Kirinaika and Tripoli and call it a state. You cannot do that. I have my map of seven fault lines inside Libya that will all act themselves out. The one between the Sanusi clan, of which the former king was a representative in Benghazi, and the Gaddafi clan further east, is just one of them. There are six others to come. Just wait. They're just waiting, knocking at the door. And the uh, process by which Fault lines come up one after the other is called history, and it's a long-term process, as far as I know. Now, the point I'm making is that if you colonize a country like this, and there's some this decolonization, dictatorship, the only way it is run, a firm hand, to introduce democracy with one man, one vote, and majority rule in Iraq and Syria is madness. If you had done that in Switzerland, all of Switzerland would have spoken German by now. And they would all be Protestant and they would have routed the Catholic minorities in Italy, in the Italian part and the French part. It's madness. Whereupon you get a Shia ruled country in Iraq and a Sunni ruled, if they get their will in Syria, you get the whole Sunni Shia thing in two neighboring countries. Now, the one that likes that is Israel of course, playing on those fault lines to come up and split and rule. Having said that, why did the Muslims, the Arab Spring, make a jump from Tunisia to Egypt? Well, this is one of the reasons. I would not put it at the feet of Gaddafi, I would put it at the feet of colonialism, constructing artificial entities. And that brings me to Wesley Clark's point. Wesley Clark went public saying that a couple of days after 9-11, the Pentagon received a list from the White House of seven countries that they could do without, where something has to be done. <laughs> and the point about those seven countries was they had central banks that were state banks, not private banks like in the US. As you know, the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor does it have reserves, so that's the reason why it's called the Federal Reserve Bank. <laughs> All of that is relatively clear. And uh, you go by the uh, terminology and you know what it is not. Like Central Intelligence Agency. But having made those quips, those seven countries were hostile to the US. And they were two starting with an I, Iraq, Iran. Two starting with an L, Lebanon, Libya. And three starting with an S, Syria, Sudan, Somalia. Not by chance, they're all Muslim countries. They have all received their treatment. Bush launched war against two of them. The person to the right of Bush, in my view, Obama, is now in six of them. But in addition to that, of course, the SEALs and the drones operating, particularly the SEALs, inside maybe 70 countries, practically speaking, all of them Muslim. What do they have against? Central banks that are state banks, they cannot globalize. The model of globalization is private banks coordinated from Basel and taking over the debt system of the world, the credit system of the world. 
It's the only type of globalization that I know about that is really taking place. So here we have the point about the Libyan war. And this points to, you see, fault lines that are <laughs> way beyond, let us say, just democracy dictatorship. And that brings me to my last point in that connection. The um, possible role of, um, yeah, let me maybe stop at that point, just say that I think, just to summarize, the globalization through private central banks is a rather major factor. And Gaddafi's plan was to use state bank and oil money for an African monetary fund and possibly for a golden dirham as African currency was received quite positively by many African countries. Then the contradiction between being a citizen and being a Muslim. It has been the major problem of the whole Muslim world. And you can say that GCC countries, the seven, the Gulf Council, they have opted more in favor of citizenship. And of course, the citizenship endowed with human rights would be the kind of thing the West would like to see. But we don't get rid of that contradiction by not wanting it. It is there, and it has paralyzed quite a lot of Arab Muslim political action for a long time. For that reason, what happens in countries like Turkey is important. And the final point I made was, of course, globalization through centralized, coordinated, private central banks. So here we have some of the things that are working. We still haven't come to the big point called Israel and its long-term policy. I'll uh, hold it for okay. the time being. Um, okay, so uh, Johan mentioned uh, colonialism. It's, it's clear to me, Mark, uh, that the, the legacy of colonialism, particularly the, 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 what the British and the French did, British were masterful at it, they would rule through the minority tribe, uh, you know, Rwanda being the example with the Tutsi. And in the case of Syria, the French, of course, ruled through the Alawite minority, and we see what's happening there today. So uh, with that in mind, let's deal with the the assumption on the part of a lot of Western analysts and particularly the neoconservatives is that the impulse between church and state or mosque and state and 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 the the uh, dichotomy that Johan did between the citizen and the and the supplicant um, uh, is uh, the example of of uh, Algeria comes up where the feasts looked like they were going to win and government reversed it and a massive slaughter took place between the GIA and the military. Um, the idea being that the assumption is that Islamists believe in democracy gets one vote, one person, one vote, one time. So how much is that, I think, that notion still pervading uh, our policy makers? I know the neocons haven't gone away. Well, there's several different dimensions of this. This, this dichotomy between the citizen and, uh, and the cultural identity exists in every tradition. This is, a, this is a part of the tension of an era of globalization. This is a part of the dynamics of uh, American politics, which is so disturbing to many of us, particularly the strident political season in which we're entering. Uh, so there's nothing peculiar about Islam. I've yet to be persuaded that Islam is different from any other cultural or religious tradition in anything, uh, but particularly in its relationship to politics. Uh, it's a part of the history trajectory of every, every religious tradition. And if you look at the largest Islamic countries, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, all of which, by the way, have had women heads of state, uh, that's never been the case of any <laughs> non-Muslim, uh, uh, certainly in America, a country, uh, as, as, a, as a cultural, regional uh, uh, fact. 
if you look at the, these are all um, uh, countries that have had a strong, uh, a fairly strong democratic tradition, challenged of course by military juntas and military dictatorships, but that's been a part of the process of all developing countries. So uh, the point is I don't think there's anything peculiar about Islam, but I think w w what Johan said is absolutely true, that there is this tension in an, in an era of globalization uh, between national identities and and cultural identities, and they uh, and they work themselves out in a variety of different ways. When I went to uh, Iraq after uh, the uh, American invasion and occupation in, uh, in in 2003, I was struck with the degree to which there was a kind of national consciousness, uh, and I was surprised for exactly the reasons that that. Johann Gay, that Iraq, of course, is of, of all of the Middle Eastern countries, perhaps the most fictitious. Uh, they're all a bit fictitious, lines drawn across the sand, just invented countries, uh, with a, a kind of ignorance of the cultural, tribal differences that that were being um, insulted by these by these lines drawn through the sand. Uh, this is particularly true uh, in, in Iraq, which was kind of what was left over in the Middle East after everything else was created, after you created Syria. And, oh, wait a second, we want to protect a chunk over here because there are a lot of Christians, let's call that Lebanon. Uh, oh, on the other side of the Jordan, let's create a country, we'll call it the Transjordan, and we'll put a, <laughs> we'll put a king in power there. And then they did the same thing with, with Iraq, and of course, imported a king from the outside. But... To, to try to unite the country, and he was quickly deposed by a military hunt. And then you have, uh, you know, the the reign of, of, of the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein. So I thought it was certainly uh, there would be, a, 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 in this moment of liberation, which was in one sense from Mubarak, an opportunity for a different kind of consciousness. And there was no question among the, the Islamic leaders with whom I spoke, especially in Al Anbar province, who despised Mubarak, but also despised the American occupation because they. Yeah, I'm sorry. Isn't it funny how I kind of conflate the two? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you saw in, in Saddam Hussein, we thought he was an American puppet, and, 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 and maybe there was a connection there, but they, they, uh, they thought that the Americans had got rid of Saddam Hussein because they, that he was weak and he was about to fall to the Islamic Revolution. And, and that's the reason why they were so stridently opposed to uh, the American occupation, because they saw him continue, them, Americans, continuing uh, the Ba'ath Party secular rule over Iraq. Uh, and my assumption was that they would, we, they would immediately see their movement as a part of a pan-Arab um, expression of politics, if not nationalism. What surprised me was that that wasn't so much the case. And how eager they were to have some sort of alliance with Shia elements, at least the Sunnis, that, that would embolden their power. They were more suspicious of the Kurds. The Kurds were always, always sort of strange people out. But among, among, the, among the Arabs, there was a sense of an Iraqi solidarity, that something had happened in, in those decades in which the fiction of the nation state to some extent had taken consciousness. And I, and I sense the same thing in Egypt when I was there with Juan in, in October. It was remarkable the degree to which there is an Egyptian national consciousness, even where it shouldn't be, even where the fiction in some ways has, has, has taken hold. Um, but, but now, of course, needs to be legitimated in, in, in a different way. If you don't have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the European ideology and the European uh, imagination of what it is as a nation state, what, what is it as an, as an Egyptian nation state? And that kind of cultural, political uh, investigation is part of the dynamics of Arab Spring and part of the dynamics of uh, movements for new national identification throughout the world, including the United States. Mm. What are we if we are no longer just an enlightenment fiction? Uh, is there a there, there, culturally, politically? We're a Christian nation. Didn't you have any heard? <laughs> well, I guess so. That's one answer. That's precisely, seems to me, what drives that kind of uh, uh, crazy enthusiasm. By the way, the, the apropos of the different way that the Arabs see their leaders and their revolutions, and and we do, um, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Syria 
uh, see Assad as an agent of the Israelis. <laughs> St Stephen, anyone you want to take a bite at any of any of the sure. uh, particularly? I just I I I'd, I'd like to get an answer to the to the to the assumption on the part of uh, the West Western analysts, particularly the neoconservatives, reinforced of course by what's happened in Egypt with the the Salafists and the and and the Brotherhood winning most of the parliament and and reneging on their deal not to run for president, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, the notion of the, the of the one man one vote mm -hmm. one time. Well, just briefly, though, to address the nation-state question, I think it's interesting when you look at the Iran-Iraq war, how when Saddam invaded Iran uh, in 1980, um, <clears throat> or sorry, 19, or sorry or 1980, that he um, he invaded the, the, the that little corner of Iran that has an ethnically Arab population, also had a fair amount of oil, not coincidentally, uh, the, the, in terms of gold, goals, but had hoped that the Arab peoples would rise up against their Persian rulers. But in fact, they did not. And then similarly, when uh, um, Khomeini um, counterattacked, and he hoped the Shiites would uh, rise up against the, uh, um, the Sunni oppressors in Baghdad, in fact, they, they held yeah. that, that the nation state you know, despite uh, uh, what many people expected, the Iran Iranian and Iraqi nation states, as artificial as they were in parts, uh, did um, uh, did hold. Now, what's interesting is that one of the very few uh, uh, Iraqi uh, groups that supported uh, Iran uh, in its war, in fact, uh, they had an armed militia that fought on the Iranian side, um, was the Supreme Council of the Islamic uh, Revolution in Iraq uh, and the, and the, and the Badr Corps which ended up becoming the core of the newly reformed Iraqi army under U.S. Uh, support. Now, th there's this myth, I think, that uh, the, 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 the so-called um, sectarian conflict in Iraq was just a matter of, oh, you know, they had the, the, the totalitarian regime put the lid on, and now they're refighting the wars they've been fighting, you know, since the 30, um, you know, since the 700s or whatever. But in fact, I, I, would, I would argue that... Um, in many ways, it's a nationalist struggle that happened to follow up along sectarian lines, not unlike uh, Northern Ireland. I mean, the Protestants and Catholics were not fighting about the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism, uh, but because the uh, you know, Catholics identified with Irish nationalism and the, and the Protestants identified with, with, with Britain. And so, uh, and, and, and um, given that the vast majority of Protestants identified with Britain, uh, radical elements of Irish nationalists uh, felt justified in putting bombs in Protestant pubs. And of course, the uh, Protestant paramilitaries uh, felt justified in uh, doing, uh, putting bombs in Catholic uh, pubs, etc. And so when the uh, Sunni Arabs in, um, in Iraq found that they were being, um, they're, they're the government was being controlled by Skiri and by Dawa, another uh, pro-Iranian uh, Shia grouping, they found that, okay, uh, we, we, we rule this country all these years, and suddenly it's under the control of our two historic enemies, <laughs> the, uh, um, the Persians and uh, the Western imperialists, specifically the United States and, and Britain. And so you had extremist Sunni groups that started to kill random, plant bombs and attack random Shia targets, and then the Shias, you know, counterattacked by, you know, the, in fact, the government... <laughs> I mean, it was like El Salvador, these government-backed death squads basically coming in and, and killing a random um, um, you know, Sunni, uh, Sunni males. And then people who um, uh, you know, you know, felt you know, threatened, you started having these sectarian cleansing in neighborhoods, and people who weren't even sectarian themselves because the army wouldn't protect them because it was controlled by the, uh, uh, by, by, uh, by the Shia factions because the U.S. would not protect them, they ended up... Um, you know, supporting these militias, even though where they weren't inclined you know, to, to, to do so. So in other words, it, it's, um, I mean, the differences between the Sunni and Shia tradition are actually less theologically than between Protestantism and Catholicism. And, and uh, there's a lot of intermarriage in uh, urban areas in Iraq. And if there's a small village with only one mosque, Sunnis and Shias would worship together. Uh, so it really was not a sectarian conflict per se, but it was something that was a direct result of the invasion and, and um, uh, and, and occupation, um, the um, <clears throat> but I, in, in many ways I think the the, um, the, 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 the the fault lines you know have been exacerbated. I mean Iraq's clearest example, but I think you know, there are other other examples as well. So I tend to to um, um, 
I mean, it's interesting that the, the, the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain, which uh, the Bahraini regime and, and, and the Saudis and the, even some elements of the Obama administration has tried to claim is this, is this Iranian-inspired Shia, you know, sectarian thing, they have uh, come out, and not only is it not true, but they have, their movement has very strongly and explicitly come out in support of the pro-democracy movement in Syria, which, we, which is, you know, stereotyped as it's a Sunni... Uh, fundamentalist thing, a, 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 a movement that uh, I think civil society, in fact, is less sect in, the, in, in the in the Middle East is a lot less sectarian uh, than I think a lot of the, you know analysts in the West would uh, would seem to indicate. Which is not to mean there aren't you know certain leaders that would manipulate that for their own own uh, own, own benefit, but uh, that it's a um, um, that the civil society I think in, in, in fact is less sectarian. Um, but in, in the uh, and but um, an example of that in Egypt would be the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a largely lay organization. It's not supported mm -hmm. by the by and, the clergy. And, and, yeah, and, and in fact, the, 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 the leaders, the, the, the leaders, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. are, are generally pretty powerful business people mm -hmm. who wear their ties both to the tourist industry and international trade. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think are, are would like to see it go in a particularly Saudi kind of direction because mm -hmm. it would be bad for business. Mm -hmm. And now you have this huge Saudi. There's some twenty percent uh, of a Salafi in the last election. No, no. I mean, frankly, the, frankly, there's some, I, I was very surprised too. And I'm in fact, I'm very suspicious about those numbers. There's a fair amount of evidence that the regime uh, uh, may have uh, played with the figures just for the very reason of saying, oh my God, these crazies are about to take over. That's why we can't leave, leave it to a civilian parliament, and that's why the military should ultimately remain in charge as a way of getting Western countries and more secular elements in, the, in, um, in, in Egypt to, to, to back, the, back the scaf. Um, so I'm, I, you know, because all the pre-election polls show them like, Maybe five percent or something mm -hmm. like that. I, uh, um, so I, I'm I'm still suspicious of those those numbers, frankly. But, but back to back to the original question, mm -hmm. that uh, I mean I think that there's a um, many ways that um, the Islamist movements have filled the void, the ideological void from the uh, perceived failures of the you know left leaning uh, Arab nationalism, certainly the failure of Western style neoliberalism. Uh, certainly, the, 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 the continued objection of this, the anachronistic uh, family dictatorships, uh, these, uh, these, 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 these monarchies. And, um, and, and I think you know, they, they have. Um, you know,